afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the webinar by Dr. Phil Renforth. It's, uh, it's fantastic to see you all. We've got participants from 10 European countries. We also have got participants from Indonesia, I believe. So welcome, very warm, warm welcome. My name is Alicia Lachinska. I'm the treasurer of the Applied Mineralogy Group. And my co-host today is Imar Didi, who is uh, the chair of the AMG. Um, just a, a, a brief um, uh, info about the talk. It, it's going to last about 30 minutes and uh, it will be followed by a Q&A. And if you've got any questions, please put it in the chat box that you can find at the bottom of your screen. Um, so before we hear from Phil, I'm going to um, pass over to Imer, who is going to tell us a little bit about what the Applied Mineralogy Group is. The floor is yours, Imer. Great, thank you very much. Um, so just very briefly, uh, thank you very much for Alicia for organizing and to Phil for being our first of our speakers in this series. Um, the Applied Mineralogy Group is a special interest group of the Mineralogical Society of Great Britain and Ireland. Um, and we as a group um, have, well, we, we do quite a few things such as running these sort of webinars, but one of the big things we do is support students. So if any of you have students who are, have applied mineralogy projects, will you please let them know that we have two bursary deadlines coming up in February and in March, and uh, all the information can be found on the Mineralogical Society website. I'd also all encourage you all to join the MINSOC or at the very least encourage your students to join the MINSOC as it is free for their first year. And um, and there are lots of different benefits, including discounts. You get a paper copy of Elements, you, um, and then you can take advantage of, of these sort of opportunities as well. Now, without any further ado, I'm going to hand over back to Alicia, who's going to introduce our speaker. Thank you very much. Many thanks, Imer. So uh, let me introduce Phil. So Dr. Phil Renforth is an Associate Professor at Harriet Watt University in Edinburgh. He's an Associate Director of the Research Centre for Carbon Solutions, his research investigates methods of atmospheric CO2 removal through reaction with rocks and minerals. His published work includes enhanced weathering, ocean alkalinity carbon storage, soil inorganic carbon, waste materials, global resource potential and techno-economic assessment. He currently leads the UKRI funded research project investigating greenhouse gas removal in the iron and steel industry which considers the reaction of carbon dioxide with alkaline waste materials. He's also a member of the UKR funded consortium, which explores, among other things, the impact of enhanced weathering um, on ocean biogeochemistry. He's a co-chief editor um, for the journal Frontiers in Climate, Negative Emission Technologies, which is the world's first dedicated publication on greenhouse gas removal. Over to you, Phil. Yeah, thanks, uh, Alicia. That was a very um, that kind introduction. Um, and uh, thanks, uh, uh, Alicia and Ima, for um, uh, organising this and inviting me to, to come and speak. I'm absolutely delighted to, to, to present. And, um, you know, usually I'd probably be recognising a lot of faces in the audience because uh, uh, I'm sort of going down the participants list and it's, uh, it's great to to see some familiar names, even though I can't see uh, everyone's faces. Um, I'm sure one day we'll, we'll be able to meet in, in person again, <laughs> rather than presenting over webinars. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm delighted to, to come present. I've been told to keep it to sort of about half an hour to, to 45 minutes um, and leave enough time for Q&A um, at the end. Ah, so we just skipped these slides. Um, my talk uh, today is going to be on the potential of alkaline materials to remove CO2 from the atmosphere. Um, and I think what I would like you to take away, if, uh, if anything, would be that you know, there is a potential there for these materials and specifically for atmospheric CO2 removal. Um, the way I'm going to structure this, this, this talk is I'll, I'll maybe give a brief update in the context in terms of climate change. Um, why it's important to remove CO2 from the atmosphere, and, and then a, an introduction to alkaline materials and how they might be able to, to remove CO2 from the atmosphere. And I think what, I, what I'm 
would try to give you the impression is that I think alkaline materials have a, a unique place within, within cl um, climate policy. Um, so I kind of hope that we'll, we'll be able to sort of evolve that, that, that view as, as the talk goes, goes forward. Um, okay, so um, let's just continue. So I suppose the, the first question I'd like to pose to you is, is there a difference between preventing CO2 emissions and removing CO2 from the atmosphere? Um, something to, to ponder um, as, as I'm sort of going through the next few slides. And I would argue that yes, there is. Um, and maybe I'll, I'll explain what, what my reasoning is behind that. Um, in terms of the climate though, well, the climate doesn't really, um, it doesn't really matter to the climate, uh, whether you're, you know, preventing an emission or removing a CO2 from the, the atmosphere. What the climate cares about is really cumulative amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. And that's what this, this graph shows, shows, you know, the temperature response to the total and cumulative amount of CO2 that, that's in the atmosphere. Um, so that's all that really the climate, climate cares about. Um, and, you know, this is obviously the, 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 this sort of graph and, and uh, sort of tells us that we're you know, rapidly approaching the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere in which we would expect a temperature response of, of one and a half degrees or larger than one and a half degrees, which is obviously more than what um, uh, we've committed to with the, the Paris Agreement. So that's, uh, you know, first thing to note. And again, this is maybe a, another graph to, to sort of highlight the importance of the, um, the challenge and that, you know, it, quite recently we, we've surpassed the Holocene temperature range, you know, we're, we're now over that one degrees worth of, worth of warming. And actually we've, we've even peaked, um, as the temperatures peaked in, in some months quite recently where it's been over one and a half degrees. So we're, we're certainly heading towards the, the um, an unsustainable uh, amount of warming, and that might be surpassed um, in the not too distant distant future. And what are the risks associated with that? Well, you know, this is uh, one of those classic burning ember diagrams. Well, you know, we're already at at one degrees worth of warming, and that's already putting um, a lot of environments and sy natural systems at risk. Um, so things like you know, cold water corals coastal flooding, terrestrial ecosystems. And that risk, um, and with a high amount of confidence in a lot of cases, that risk is gonna get um, uh, more severe um, as we increase the amount of temperature uh, that we're um, experiencing. So, you know, the, this, um, the way to think about this really is that, you know, we've got, uh, we're increasing the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, we're increasing the cumulative amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, and we're rapidly approaching the limit uh, to surpass one and a half degrees worth of warming. So the, the point really is that being able to remove CO2 from the atmosphere is a way potentially to, to balance emissions, but also to, to, to reduce the amount of cumulative CO2 um, if, if should we surpass that, that limit. Um, one way to th that, that I think about this, and I think it's kind of a good way to think about solutions to climate change, is that it's a that it, it's a bit like piecing together a jigsaw, right? So you you're putting, you know, maybe a little bit of wind here, um, a bit of um, bioenergy, managing soils. So you're trying to, you know, looking at dietary changes. So you're trying to piece together this this jigsaw of lots of different solutions, and I think. You know, science can tell us something about how big those pieces could be. So, you know, the size of the, the jigsaw pieces change, obviously. So we can put more wind in or we can put more dietary changes in or more biomass energy. But, but ultimately, the, the piecing together of this jigsaw is a political action. It's, it's one that essentially is shaped by values. And it's not just um, it's, uh, what science can tell us. So... We've got to be mindful that you know this jigsaw is going to be put together by um, people with varying amounts, uh, varying political viewpoints. Um, and I think maybe one of my major concerns with climate change is that we won't be able to compromise on what the final picture will look like. Um, so I suppose that's something to, to to keep in the back of your mind is that you know um, 
we're piecing to this together this jigsaw. And I, what I would suggest is that having extra pieces, so things that remove CO2 from the atmosphere are part of that, that puzzle is, um, is going to be beneficial, I think, to um, how we put this together. Okay, so um, if you didn't know, this is from the, the quite the recent uh, IPCC 1.5 um, degree report in 2018. Um, and this has really got us thinking um, quite a lot now about removing CO2 from the atmosphere, because what it shows is that if we want to get to net zero emissions, which you know the UK is now uh, legislated for, it's part of our law, and a lot of other countries are, are following suit now, um, we have to essentially uh, reach net zero emissions uh, sometime in the mid century. Um, and these are two scenarios uh, on the screen here that show um, the, the pathway to, to net zero. Um, and you can see that, you know, both of those um, pathways include removing CO2 from the atmosphere. And that's what the, the area underneath the, um, underneath the, the graph shows. And you can see that in maybe one scenario it might not be so much on the order of a few gigatons, which is still obviously quite a lot. Whereas, you know, if, um, if we don't emit, uh, reduce our emissions uh, quick enough, then it could be a, as much as 20 gigatons of CO2 by the end of the century. Now that should be really quite sobering. What is really quite sobering, I think, is that that needs to start sometime within the next 10 years in, in terms of upscaling. So we really need to start pulling CO2 out of the atmosphere now, even though we might want to get to net zero by, um, uh, by mid-century. And the point is that both of these graphs go past zero. They go net, net negative towards the end of the century. And we can't do that without removing CO2 from the atmosphere. So that's, uh, I think, a really important thing to, to consider. Um, but I think fundamentally, these aren't a replacement for sense of emissions reductions. So we're geophysically limited by the amount of CO2 we can pull out of the atmosphere and by no stretch of the imagination could we do it at the scale to, to mitigate all of the emissions. So we really do need to reduce our emissions at the same time as thinking about this removal. Um, and one thing I was, I'd, I'd like, um, that may, that's maybe not so apparent when you first start thinking about this is what the cost, the change in this, this emphasis on going to net zero is on the cost of, of solving the problem. You know, the, sorry, the, the, the quality of this diagram is not great, but uh, this is something that you might recognize. It, it sort of pop, these sorts of diagrams popped out in the early 2000s, sort of carbon abatement costs, showing that, you know, the, the more abatement that you do, the sort of higher the cost is. And, you know, maybe there's a, a bunch of stuff we can do that saves us money, you know, um, energy efficiency improvements, switching light bulbs, that sort of thing. And then eventually, you know, the cost goes positive and we have to stop paying for things. And then um, the more we abate, the higher the cost, cost is. And the point is, is that when we were thinking about these sorts of diagrams, we were sort of post, you know, Kyoto, when we were thinking about 60% emissions reduction. And you can see in this diagram, there's a sort of tentative dot, dotted line of higher abatement costs, you know, so sort of what, what it might look like if we went to, to higher abatements. And obviously these don't actually amount to, to anywhere near the amount, the targets that we, we, we want now. And I think what's, what's quite interesting is that, you know, if we start running these, so this is, these are from integrative assessment models. If we start running these models to 100% um, CO2 removal, so net zero, and this is what the cost of CO2 looks like in these models. Again, this, these are just models, but I think the point is, is that, you know, running them to, you know, running them to 50% or 60% is completely different than running them to 100%. Um, so, you know, conven conventional mitigation, if you want to call it, that might get us so far, um, but, and that we might then be able to use negative emissions to mop up the last part of that, that, that cost curve. And you can see that, well, maybe the area under that graph is the total amount of cost. Um, and it might be that, that, you know, the long tail that wags the, the, the climate dog, if you know what I mean. So the, the cost of the, the, the last 10% of our reduction might be as great as the, the, the cost of the, the, the previous 90%. So it's something to, to, to think in mind. And what I think negative emissions uh, helps us to do is actually put a cap on that that cost if we can find a way of, of scaling negative emissions. So if we can cap 
that uh, if we can cut the cost of removing CO2 from the atmosphere, you know, while it might be more expensive in and of itself compared to a lot of other options, it at least helps us control the, the last part of that, that cost curve. Uh, so I'm not, I'm not really going to go much more into uh, negative emissions now. I just wanted to highlight some um, reports that have come out in the last couple of years and more, more will come out. So re people re are really starting to think about this, this subject. Um, and, you know, just to flag up different ideas within this space, you know, from sucking CO2 directly out of the air to planting forests to... Um, you know, growing biomass and burning it and injecting the CO2 underground. None of the, these technologies will scale to, by themselves to do to do what we need. So there's going to be a need to be a portfolio approach of different different approaches. So, um, okay. Um, so again, just reiterating, it's not a substitute for reducing emissions, removing CO2 from the atmosphere. That is, um, it is functionally different from um, reducing emissions. So it does have a different um, policy context and importance. Um, not, not saying that reducing emissions is not important, but it has a different um, mechanism and different function. And it's potentially harder to do. So um, notionally that would equate to a higher equilibrium cost in that, that cost model. So um, even though we might have technologies that be more expensive, they, they still might uh, have a utility and it's needed. Okay, so we're gonna to need to do it and we're gonna to need to find a way of doing it. At scale. Okay, so chemical weathering, um, I suppose, is one idea is, you know, we know that natural chemical weathering removes CO2 from the atmosphere. And for those, I think most people are probably geologists on the call, but if you're not, then, uh, you know, essentially what nature does is turn, you know, things like volcanic rocks into carbonates. Um, and, you know, you see that there's no carbon on this side and there's carbon on this side and the carbon here notionally come from the Earth system. So it's um, indirectly been removed from the, from the atmosphere. So, you know, can we replicate what nature does over geological time to, to be relevant on, on a human time scale? And, you know, if we can crack this nut, then it's potentially massive. So, you know, if you look at all of the carbon in the Earth system, and that's what this diagram represents, the amount of carbon in different pools within the within the Earth, and this is the atmosphere pool, the, the ocean pool. Um, you can see that, you know, what, this is what we've done in terms of em emissions so far. This is what we might do in the future, these representative size of the boxes. So we're really plugging in a large amount of CO2 into the Earth, into the atmosphere and into the Earth system. And well, you know, what can our silicate, what, are, what can our mineral resource do for capturing CO2? What can the weathering resource do? Well, it's actually the size of this circle. So, you know, if you imagine this circle being projected out of the around the screen, well, that's the amount of rock resource at the Earth's surface that could capture CO2. And I mean, I think it's um, it's quite interesting that that material is really wants to react with CO2. It's thermodynamically um, uh, favorable for that to react with CO2. It's quite a disconcerting thought to think that there's so much rock at the Earth's surface that just really wants to react with CO2, um, but we can't because of, you know, it's, it's kinetics really. So it's, it's um, you know, if, if the kinetic um, constant was just slightly different for this, this rock, then we, we'd be living on a very different planet. Um, so, you know, I could spend a whole talk talking about the, uh, the, the natural materials uh, to react CO2 with CO2. And I suppose I, I think um, one of the next talks with the, uh, uh, the, the, the MINSOC, uh, the Applied Mineralogy Group are organizing, um, it's given by Jörg Matter, who might talk about some of the, 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 um, the, the ideas of reacting CO2 with basalt. So um, I'll, I'll maybe just plug his talk. I, I don't know what he's going to talk about, but I'll just, uh, I'll just leave it there. But I'm really interested in um, talking about in this, this presentation is using alkaline materials. And this is a pretty uncomfortable name I've given to a range of different materials that essentially produce high pH liquors when they, when they react with water. Um, in the top three, the, the, the alkaline materials are actually um, byproducts of the, the industry. So things like iron and steel slags, uh, tailings and waste rocks, red mud from the aluminium industry. So these are secondary products, byproducts and wastes. Um, and then uh, we also have pro actual products from industries as well, like cement and lime. 
So, you know, I'm interested in, in understanding how these react with CO2. Um, the reactions that we're talking about, maybe I should have presented this earlier as well. There's two systems that, um, that we're, we're thinking about. One is carbonation reacting um, essentially the, the mineral with CO2 to produce a new mineral, calcium carbonate. Um, and there's also um, a, a maybe more recently been proposed ideas of reacting the mineral to produce essentially alkalinity in the oceans. Um, and I, again, I could have spent a whole talk talking about ocean alkalinity, but probably for the sake of this one, I'm not going to go into any detail about it. But just uh, to flag up that there is another idea, other ideas out there for how to facilitate these reactions. Um, so, what you, some of you might be questioning? Well, you know these these materials come from high high emitting industries. So, you know things like the cement industry or the steel industry contribute quite a lot to global CO2 emissions. You know, how can the, the products of that really make any difference? Um, and I suppose uh, what I'd point out, so, you know, is a sort of cartoon, you know, we, most of these industries work this way is that they stick in limestone as a raw material. They put in fossil energy, release a whole ton of CO2, loads of, loads of CO2, and produce alkaline materials. Um, and I think in the past, what, what the way that these are, the potential of these alkaline materials for capturing some of that CO2 um, has been, well, you know, we can capture a little bit, you know, and every little, every little helps. Um, and I think that's the wrong way of thinking about this. Um, and let me explain. So, you know, this is currently the present day that these industries operate. Um, but, you know, you think, well, this isn't going to be the case in 2050. You know, if you think of the cement industry or the steel industry, you know, maybe they'll still use limestone as a resource um, and the, they'll be putting in a lot less fossil energy in. So, you know, some of the energy vectors for cement and steel will be things like low carbon electricity, low carbon hydrogen and biomass energy. And on top of that, they'll stick something um, like a CCS unit capturing the CO2 created in that process. So that actually there's only a small amount of, of CO2 and potentially by balance uh, zero you know, net CO2 coming out of the, out of the process. So you know, where does that leave the potential of alkaline materials? Well, it leaves them with a latent potential of capturing CO2 from the atmosphere and one that we, we, um, it would be daft not to ex exploit. Um, so, you know, in some ways we've already been doing this for, for quite a long time, um, both in research and in, uh, and now sort of more recently in comm commercial ventures. So, you know, this is uh, some really nice work by OCO Technology, uh, who are taking waste material, alkaline waste material, uh, reacting with CO2 to produce aggregates. Um, and this is um, really, uh, you know, wonderful stuff that they're, they're doing. Um, but they're, they're using, and, and again, this is backed up by extensive research from the early 2000s onwards, really looking at reacting CO2 with, with alkaline materials. But I think what's, what's distinct now is really, can we do this with atmospheric CO2? So, you know, this work has shown that we can, we can do it with, you know, con more concentrated CO2, or pure CO2 or flue gases um, in some cases. But, um, you know, can we do it at scale with, atmospheric CO2. And I think that's really what, um, what uh, really drives my research at the moment. Um, so can these materials capture atmospheric CO2 is the question. And, you know, maybe just briefly as part of my talk, I'll take you on two um, case studies of, of where this is happening accidentally. Um, so some really interesting sites uh, around the UK where this is already happening. Um, the first place that's kind of interesting to look at is um, this place in the in the in the in the Brecon uh, yeah in the Brecon Beacons. It's called Herbert's Quarry. Uh, so this, this is just north of Cardiff, Merthyr uh, Tydfils there, and uh, just um, just north of the, the heads of the valley roads. So it's really um, quite a nice nice place to go and walk um, if you if you're in the area. So this is uh, me and my team. Uh, when I used to work at Cardiff, we went up to have a little uh, reconnaissance of the, the site. Uh, you can see behind us that they've, there's, there's some mounds of, 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 um, of alkaline lime that, that have been deposited on the side of the, the hill. Um, 
essentially this is a sort of an aerial view of the, the site. You can see there's the, the former quarry at the quarry face at the back of the, the site. And essentially the quarrying dumps limestone into these light two lime kilns you see here. So the, the site that I should say is you know operated in sort of Victorian times. It was it's um I think it closed in over 100, 150 years ago. So it's really um uh really quite an old site. Um or maybe about 100 years ago, I'm probably exaggerating there. So you see limestone went into the top of the kilns to produce lime and CO2 emissions. Um, and that lime was, well, most of, it, most of it was sold into market and essentially rolled down the hill into, um, into agricultural land. Um, but yeah, some of it was obviously deposited on the side of this, this hill. And that's, that some of that material is then reacted with CO2 to produce new carbonate materials. So... Um, and this is uh, just a, an image of the, just at the bottom of that slope where the sort of outwash has is, is formed these really nice tufas of carbonate. But you can also see it within the, within the, the lime kilns of these sort of speleothem type formations. It's really quite an interesting place to, to go. And uh, this is um, it's actually quite old. This is um, work by Julian Andrews, uh, looking at the, some of the, the geochemistry on this site. Um, and it's, uh, uh, one interesting and really fascinating part of, the, of these sites is the sort of weird isotopic signature that comes out of the, the carbon and oxygen isotopes in the carbonates. You know, we, typical carbonates that, we, that form in soils uh, sort of form in this, this area. And you can see that these are really exceptionally light for, for um, what we would normally expect in uh, pedogenic carbonates. I should say, you know, we, we've done a lot of work on, on the different types of carbonates from all sorts of high pH environments. And they seem to form quite a nice mixing, mixing line between um, a sort of lithogenic end member, if you, if you want to call it that, and this sort of high pH atmospheric uptake end member. So it's, it's really kind of interesting that, that you know, all, very much a, a unique finger, fingerprint a signature from, from these environments. Um, okay, so in the next slide I, I want to, to take you to is um, some work I've done previously um, uh, with colleagues looking at demolition waste. So um, the, the headline uh, we'll come back to in a second. I mean, this is me on uh, one of the demolition sites we were looking at. And, you know, if there's anything more uh, um, uh, sort of symbolic about being a PhD student then I, I, I don't think there's <laughs> I don't think there's uh, an image that, that beats that but this is a former site in, in um, Newcastle um, that we were looking at um, this is essentially where they used to brew brown ale and it was a, in a large concrete building that they knocked down and spread some of that demolition waste onto the onto the site and um, so we, we put a survey grid down and collected quite a large number of samples um, and maybe to cut the long story short, there is quite a lot of ca carbonate within the soils. But of course, you know, it's concrete, so it could be carbonate from the limestone aggregate. Um, but essentially monitoring this over time, you could see that the, in pretty much all of the samples that we analyzed, we were gaining carbonate. And, and similarly, the isotopic signature showed that those were getting lighter. So we were, we were you know, generating new carbonate within the, within the soil. Um, and you could, could proportion that to, to the essentially the amount of CO two that was uptaken, um, and so you know just summarising that we we got a sort of an average drawdown across the site of something like ten well let's say eight and a half kilos of CO two per meter squared per year, which is actually quite phenomenal really. I mean it's if you if you got a, a um, I don't know a bioenergy crop growing on the site, it probably wouldn't do, do as well as that. So it's, you know, spatially, it's really quite a large amount of CO2 uptake. Um, so that was kind of kind of interesting as well. We've got, you know, CO2 at a spatially meaningful scale. Uh, but, you know, this is not, again, particularly new. These are, you know, wherever you get concrete really weathering in the environment, you see carbonate forming on it. So it's, you know, it's, you know, when you, I suppose, when you, once you know what to look for, you do see it all the time. Um, okay. Uh, and, and so maybe just a, as a summary to that, I mean, the, the amount of um, CO2 that, uh, essentially the, the potential of that material um, for reacting with CO2 had reached about, about 80% within five years. So, you know, if you think it, 
that material has got a maximum amount of CO2 we can uptake, defined by its chemistry, then we, we, we reckon that you know, within five years of the, the building being demolished, um, about 80% of that potential has been reached. So that's kind of phenomenal, really, to think about. So, I mean, I, maybe just the, the, the last site I want to, um, uh, to, for you to think about um, is um, work we've done on slag heaps. And this, the, the, essentially, the summary of that is almost the opposite of what um, uh, we've previously found, is that actually uh, not so much conversion in even quite a lot, long period of time. Um, not, not on this slide, actually. This is um, Scunthorpe Steelworks. Um, but uh, we actually have a, a, another site we're interested in, which I'll show you now. But this is um, part of a, um, a research project that we had funded as part of the Greenhouse Gas Removal Program in the UK, um, and involving quite a, a range of um, academic and, and industrial partners um, within this. So, um, Okay, I'll just take you to, to, to concept for our, our final uh, field stop here. So this is in the northeast of England. Um, it's uh, essentially it had a, a, a steelworks on the site from 1840 all the way through to 1980. Um, and in the process of that 140 years, they, they developed quite a large pile of slag. It's about 30 million tons that sit on the, on the, the side of this, this hill. Um, this is a circa 1960s uh, photo. It doesn't actually look like this anymore. It's really quite a nice crust area that uh, folks walk their dogs over. It's really, um, not many people really sort of realize that it's a, it, it's a slag heap. What's really interesting is that that whole pile of, of slag essentially drains through um, a culvert system out through one, one drainage outlet. So geochemically, it's really well constrained. It just um, we can we can essentially mass balance the, the material coming out of the um, the, the slag heap um, and the, the the carbon. We can mass balance the carbon, so we know you know how much is weathering coming out of the, the slag heap, but how much CO two and carbonate is being formed. You can see that actually in the drainage waters here, we've got this a, a new tufa formation of, of of calcium carbonate that's that's forming there. Um, what's even quite remarkable is that, you know, the, the waters coming out of this heap have been pH 11 and a half for, um, for you know, 40 years, really, since the, since the measurements started. So it's a really fascinating place to go and analyse. We, we essentially took a drilling rig onto the site. We, we drilled through the depth to about sort of 25 metres um, and collected collected samples uh, through, the, through the material and analyze them for their, their mineralogy and the, the cation content and carbonate content. You know, this is some of the samples um, that we drilling out of the, the heap. I'm probably going to disappoint uh, the mineralogists out there because I haven't really included that much mineral <laughs> mineralogy in my talk. Um, but I hope you'll forgive me for that. Maybe this is this this is some goes somewhere to compensate for um, for that. But this is uh, some of the um, X-ray diffractograms that we, we generated as part of that work. And what was kind of interesting was that you know there's a lot of um, a range of minerals within the site. Melolites uh, group minerals seem to be predominant, which is not untypical for, for slag, um, and a bunch of cement minerals as well, which again isn't isn't particularly un, un, untypical. Um, but what was I think what I was expecting from the site was a lot more uh, hetero, uh, heterogeneity. Um, you know, the slag at the bottom of the heap was generated in the 1920s, and that the processes for doing that were completely different from you know, the sort of 19 70s slag that were, should have been at the top of the pile. But you can see that actually the, the mineralogy isn't really that much different. So that was in some ways quite surprising to us. Um, and, you know, potentially um, some of the heterogeneity might have been weathered out of the slag over the 40 years. And what we see is maybe more recalcitrant material. But either way, I mean, that's still quite an interesting, an interesting output. Um, but yeah, maybe just to re recamp, uh, I'll recount on some of these uh, the, the, these alkaline materials. Um, you know, they've accidentally captured um, uh, CO two in 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 some cases quite meaningful quantities, right? So um, 
it sort of gives us hope that you know we could engineer these these systems to remove CO2 intentionally. They have some really weird isotope signatures, which are, are fun to, to think about and at least give us a handle on how much atmospheric CO2 is being taken up. And again, the conversion extents for a lot of these are unknown, but you know, some of the, the, the sites we were looking at were quite large ext conversion extents. So again, that gives us hope that we can we can engineer these, these processes. And okay, so the, the final part of my talk is really well asking, well, what is the potential moving forward? And what significance do they have for um, capturing CO2 um, on a global scale? And this is maybe just summary some of the uh, to summarize some of the um, sort of forecasting models we've we've done on these materials. And we see that you know global current estimates uh, or that the CO2 capture potential is something on the order of a gigaton of CO2 per year, which is again based on sort of my estimates, but also a lot of other folks have. have come to the same conclusion, you know, roughly the same sort of number, which isn't insignificant in and of itself. Um, but what we've done is projected what this might look like in 2100, which is, you know, given more material might be produced in a range of socioeconomic um, scenarios. Uh, and essentially, you know, looking at saturation models of, of different economies, looking at how much material uh, scales with, with GDP. And, and that's... Um, Essentially, what we're coming out with is sort of production estimates for for future production of things like cement and steel and lime and um, you know maybe some of the important um, uh, the, the metals that produce basic uh, mine waste, ultra basic mine waste. So um, that's kind of uh, interesting in and of itself. But and then you sort of multiply those production by um, the amount of CO two that that these materials can capture and you know this is where the distinction between the ocean alkalinity side and the carbonation side come in and again I, I just highlight you know there is a sort of greater potential if, if ocean alkalinity was was used but that's maybe not um, really that that relevant for, for waste particularly if they, they they have an environmental impact so you know carbonation just, just considering the carbonation potential you can see that well you know maybe by the end of the century that one gigaton will scale to several gigatons, you know, three to, to maybe six is what we, we, three to seven is what we had in mind. So, you know, when we need to remove 10 gigatons of CO2 from the atmosphere or 20 gigatons of CO2 from the atmosphere, three to seven gigatons is actually quite a lot. So it could be an incredibly important part of, um, and potentially low cost method of removing CO2 from the atmosphere. Um, if we find a way to do it, you know, at a low cost and that way that, that, technology could change the equilibrium price of all of these other negative emission technologies, right? So it could be a way of pulling down that, 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 that equilibrium price. So I think they have a, an enormous potential within that, that portfolio of negative emission technologies to, to really um, to make a difference. Um, but, you know, we're only talking about gr this gross negative emissions. And for this really to be effective is we need to reduce the emissions from the industries that produce them as well. So. That's a, um, a sort of final thought, really. So um, just to summarize, again, uh, it may be possible to react multiple gigatons of CO2 per year with, uh, by the end of the century with those materials. Um, and I think one of the most important uh, parts of this will be the, the reaction of CO2 with cement at the end of its life cycle. So, you know, there are some ideas around reacting cement, CO2 with cement during its life cycle and you know, part of the curing process. Um, but there are limits to how much of that potential CO2 uptake you can reach. So before you start um, reducing the strength of the material, um, what will be really important is uh, capturing the CO2 at the end of its end of, end of life of the cement. Um, it's kind of interesting. I mean, in the UK, we produce we, we, we produce enough cement to capture something between five and ten. So sorry, we produce enough cement C and D waste, cement and uh, construction and demolition waste. Um, cementitious rich material uh, to capture something on the order of five to 10 million tons of CO2 per year. Um, the cement industry in the UK produces something like four million tons of CO2 per year. And the difference is, is that we produced a lot more cement in the 1960s, which is really starting to become available. If you, it's a horrible way of saying it, but you know, we're knocking down some of those 1960s buildings and really we're not capturing any of the CO2 that it could, you know, we're, we're, we're we're wasting that latent, latent potential of CO2 uptake in, in that demolition waste. 
you know, we're just recycling it for, for aggregate, which is, you know, something that can be done at the same time as capturing its CO2. So it's kind of interesting, really, is that we could do a lot um, at, at policy relevant scale with, with, with these materials. Um, it de depends on decarbonizing industry, absolutely essential, but it could be the, the extra bit that really helps sort of get to zero and that gets, get to net zero. Um, and, but I think a, a lot of more research is required. Um, you know, a lot has been done on that, that sort of higher CO2 um, carbonation, uh, higher CO2 uh, purity reaction experiments. I think a lot needs to be done at the sort of lower purity ambient conditions, which requires a lot longer experiments, right? So instead of working within hours, we're looking at maybe months to even years for, for that, to, that technology to, that, those experiments to, to sort of, um, uh, to, to be to be run, so it does require a lot of uh, longitudinal experiments that we really haven't done yet. So um, again, I've just popped up a few papers if you want to to read further. But I'm you know more than happy to to either chat uh, and answer some questions now, or we can uh, you know chat offline if you wanted to get in contact with me. There's my email address there. So uh, that's that's all I had. Thanks a lot. That's fantastic, Phil. It was a, a really good talk. Bravo. Um, very informative, I must say. And, and, and I couldn't agree more that we need a portfolio of, of different technologies to tackle the CO2 issues. Um, and I also agree very much so on the experimental work with real, very complex chemically, mineralogically materials we have to start working with those real, real materials. Um, so yes, we've got quite a few questions and I will start with a question that came um, early. Um, have you considered um, working with um, magnesium rich materials, so serpentinites, olivines? Um, yeah, so I mean, I did a little bit of work in, in the past looking at olivines, particularly um, for, the, for this idea called enhanced weathering is if you spread minerals onto the land surface. Um, and we've done some experimental work uh, looking at, you know, how quickly might olivine dissolve if you added it to a, to a soil, um, trying to sort of constrain those, those kinetics. I mean, I suspect if you, if you did that in practice, you probably would be looking more at, at basalt rather than olivine. I think that's more, more of an interesting uh, material for that, that application. But um, yeah, and we've currently got work at the moment uh, ongoing looking at, at olivine addition to coastal environments. So an idea of replacing beach nourishment uh, material with, with, with olivine uh, sort of it's called coastal enhanced weathering. The idea is that maybe the wave action will, will help speed up the dissolution. And that's something that we're, we're quite keen to test, whether, we, whether that is actually the case or not. We're, we're, we're still interested, though. Interesting. Um, right, so let me go for the questions which we've got in the chat. Um, so the first one is, and I think you partially have answered that question already in your talk, but can stable isotope analysis of alkaline waste tell us about the source of CO2? captured, uh, the lithogenic, organic, and hydroxylated CO2 have oxygen and carbon signatures that are almost linear. Yeah, so I, 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 think, I think I understand the question. I suppose I, I, maybe I did, I hope I answered that during my talk. It, it, that's what we've been using the isotope signatures to do is uh, to sort of fingerprint or at least sort of calculate the, the, the amount of CO2 that we think is coming from the atmosphere versus how much is coming from uh, a, a limestone that might have been mixed up into, into the material. So, um, yeah, that's, that's what we've been using it for. Yeah. Thank you. Do you have information on the particle size distribution on the, of the demolition waste you studied? 79% uh, carbonation of cement in five years would indicate millimeter centimeter sized particles at normal concrete carbonation rates, which would be consistent with crusher fines rather than the average size to which we are reducing the concrete. Yeah, that, that's right. So I think what, uh, what on, that, on that site, you know, the I can't remember exactly what the size distribution was off the off the back of my head, but I suspect that was that was the reject finds from the jaw crusher. So they probably recycled um, quite a lot of that material. Um, 
which was, you know, the, the aggregate size particles. And what we were analyzing was maybe more of the fines. Um, yeah, so I, th I think that answers the question. Uh, there's probably, a, a, you know, a well count, you know, if we, if we wanted to do this in practice, does that mean we'd have to crush up the, um, the, the concrete to smaller particle sizes? And I suppose that the answer to that question is, um, we, we can do that. I mean, crushing, crushing rocks to millimeter size isn't really that energy intensive. Um, maybe that's a surprise to, to people, but we can crush to, you know, millimeter size particles for, you know, tens of kilowatt hours per ton. So we, that's not a barrier. I think I'm probably reading too much into that question now. Right. Um, the next one. Um, do you think there is a strong argument for using these legacy alkaline deposits for sequestration rather than potentially using as feedstocks to manufacture new materials? Or is it uh, more of a case by case basis? Yeah, I mean, it probably is case, case by case basis, but um, I don't think these are necessarily mutually exclusive ideas. So I think, you know, you can carbonate a material and then use it as a secondary aggregate, which is what, um, you know, OCO technology are doing. I think what's kind of interesting is if you apply a value to CO2, atmospheric CO2 removal, then I think it will be more valuable to capture CO2 than to recycle the material. So your primary aim of, of using that material will be for its CO2 capture function. And the secondary value will be recycling it as a new material. Yes, I, I agree actually on that. Um, most of your analysis assumes that we have to mine and quarry significant quantities of metals and limestone, considering we are hoping to significantly reduce primary produc production how does this affect your conclusion? Um, so my assumption isn't that we need to, so for, for the talk I gave, uh, I didn't assume that we need to extract any new material. This is sort of products and byproducts from existing industries. Um, and what um, essentially what I was doing was looking what the potential of those materials were. And I think the answer to the question is, well, the socioeconomic pathways that I was using uh, had a range of different material demand um, uh, pathways within them. So, you know, it's a sign of it, it's kind of already in the model, right? Looking at, you know, if we reduced our, our demand, what would that mean for material production? So it's, it is built into the, into the model. If I may comment on that as well, um, and I'm sure Imar will agree with me. So in the transition to low carbon future, we, we will require more raw materials, critical metals, more mining, so if we can incorporate um, mineralization of mine tailings, that would probably support sustainable mining. So nickel mining, we've got loads of ma magnesium rich materials associated with ultramafics. I think there is a, quite a huge scope, but it's, it's, it's dealing with the real materials rather than simple serpentines, olivines. Right, um, next question. Great presentation, Phil. Um, regarding carbonation on land, would the idea be that the carbonate material sits where the process occurred or be stored somewhere else, be converted into new construction materials as opposed to ocean alkalinity where the carbonates basically sink to the ocean depths? I think it's still an open question about where these materials might end up, you know, the carbonate materials. I think they, they have a lot of value being recycled back into into um, into construction, uh, but potentially they could end up in, you know, stockpiles or in, um, you know, regeneration of, of, of mines, for instance, uh, you know, it's new, it's new material to fill in, fill in voids. So I suppose it's still an open question, really. Okay, so uh, I'm just looking at time and I, I know that um, quite a few people here have got other commitments at four o'clock. So we can allow two more questions and the rest we will answer by email if that's all right with everyone. So the next one on the list is, did you look at lateral variation in the concept slug heap? If it was tipped at the steep phase, it might show proximal to distal variation rather than top down layering. Yeah, so we, we, we drilled uh, three three boreholes um, within within the heap, um, and they 
total, I think we covered about 150 meters of, of lateral variation and it really didn't make a difference. I mean, it, it was um, it, it was really quite surprising how homogenous, relatively homogenous the material was compared to a lot of other you know, waste materials I've, I've analyzed. This is really quite surprising actually. Um, so yeah, you know, there the, the could have been some sorting associated with, uh, with the tipping, but I mean, it's, yeah, it's just, it was just a surprising outcome, I think. Okay, and the last question for today. Climate-wise, we are running out of time. So what can we do to speed things up for our climate? That's a, a nice general question mm. to, to end on. I suppose, yeah, we're running out of time, but um, I, I suppose we need to work ways of incentivizing change. Um, so um, to make activities that reduce CO2 emissions and maybe even remove CO2 out of the atmosphere to find some way of incentivizing those. Um, the UK government is uh, having a, hosting a consultation on a carbon tax at the moment, and that might be a really interesting way of incentivizing some sectors to, to remove CO2. Um, you know, there are other incentivization strategies in the in um, you know in the US. There's a there's a tax, and there's also um, some tax rebates for for CO2 injection underground. Um, I mean, to think about it this way, I, you know the the feed-in tariff for our renewable energy um, uh, renewable energy uh, systems uh, worked out to be something like $110 per ton of CO2 if you, you know, converted it to equivalent, equivalent CO2. So, you know, we, we, can, we can put large um, incentives onto CO2 um, reduction technologies. And look at what's happened in terms of our, our wind energy, right? Uh, the, the, the sort of wind sector in the UK. So, you know, that, that was growing, I think, you know, 12 or 13% per year. Um, I don't know if it's still doing that now, but, you know, certainly they're gonna, that's going to continue, I hope, over the, the next couple of decades. So we can incentivize system change over decade time periods. So we just need to find a way of incentivizing it. Perfect. Okay. Thank you very much. That was really super, super talk. Before we close up, may I just have a, a brief announcement? As, as uh, Phil has mentioned, our next talk is on the 28th of January. We will advertise it as, as we had before, and it will be by Professor Jörg Matter on mineral carbonation of basalts, the carb fix project. Very exciting. And the following talk uh, will be in March. So we try to run them every two months. And it will be by Professor Eva Hartai from Miskolc University, and she'll be talking on production of energy and metals in an interlinked process. I'm sure some of you have heard about combined heat and power Horizon 2020 projects, and Eva will give us updates on that. Um, on that note, many thanks everyone for joining. Um, may I take the opportunity of wishing everyone good festive season and hopefully see you in January. Hello there, thanks for coming to my talk on Thursday last week. Um, I, sorry I wasn't able to get through all of the answers to all of the questions um, uh, after, the, after the talk. Uh, so the, the Mineralogical Society and the Applied Mineralogy Group have asked me to, um, to provide a supplementary video to, to go through them, which I'm more than happy to do. Uh, so th the first question is by James Craig, uh, and he asks, most extractive industries that are high CO2 emitters are likely to be more interested in relatively rapid carbonation of alkaline wastes. This will require an engineered solution and engineer energy input. What are your thoughts on this approach and e economics? Um, well, first, probably just rephrase the question there. Um, I, st I think most um, industries aren't necessarily interested in rates, they're interested in cost. And if you can provide a, a, a low cost way of carbonating alkaline, alkaline materials the, and also at the same time exploiting the, um, the, the, the resource as much as possible as in higher conversion rates, then it doesn't really matter how quickly that happens in, in some senses, it matters how costly it is, um, providing that it happens on a, on a time scale that is relevant, policy relevant for climate change. So. Um, that's one thing to be said. But, uh, the other side of that, I think, is um, 
I'm a quite a big fan of the the engineered approaches, and they in, they aren't necessarily high energy and um, uh, high cost. You know, so a lot of the the approaches that look at carbonating alkaline materials in a reactor aren't necessarily um, intensive in terms of engineering or energy. So I suppose that's another part part of that. Um, Okay, the next question is from uh, Benjamin Tinsk. I hope I'm pronouncing your, your name correctly. Um, in which regions of the world do you see the most potential availability for reactant materials, uh, either industry waste or naturally occurring rocks like basalt and olivine? Um, it's a really good question. Thanks, Ben. I suppose the, uh, a lot of these materials are pretty ubiquitous across the, the globe. I mean, particularly for cement. I mean, something like 5% of cement uh, consumption is through, through import. The majority of cement that we consume is indigenously produced. So um, we produce this material across the globe. Of course, more in um, countries uh, produce, so some countries produce it more than others. Um, and the same goes for, for things like, uh, it, it, the story is a little bit different when you're looking at um, things like slag, which come from steel production. And steel is obviously a lot more mobile than, than cement is. So. Um, Again, the you know the, the distribution of, of steel production isn't uh, is, is widespread, but obviously it happens in in in, um, uh, in, more, in some countries more than others. So, um, in terms of the, the natural materials, well, uh, basalt is pretty ubiquitous as well. Again, of course, it, it occurs more in in some countries than others, but I wouldn't say there's necessarily a hot spot, you know, where this. Um, material uh, where this, I, these ideas are exploiting this carbonation potential would occur uh, over others. Uh, and the same goes for, for olivine. So I, I, I think it's probably the, the spatial constraints aren't resource constraints. I think the spatial constraints are probably more to do with um, things like labor costs and energy costs than they are for mineral resource. Um, okay, and final one from uh, Benjamin. Uh, where do you see the role for technology development to improve processes? Um, and in, in parentheses, you've got grinding machines, transport, electrochemistry, me measurement of CO2 to carbonate conversion, ecosystem toxicity measurement, etc. And um, again, this is another another good question. I suppose maybe I'll just give you give you one uh, to to answer that. Um, some really, I mean, there's a whole range of things that we we need to think about within that space. But just on your first point around grinding, well, um, so gr grinding technology, while it's quite an old technology, is relatively energy inefficient. Um, so, you, you know, crushing down to, to sand sized particles can be re relatively efficient. But if you want to go smaller than that, and say you want to use a, a ball mill or um, some sort of roller mill, when you start going down to um, really fine particle sizes, the efficiency of the comminution equipment, the, the grinding equipment, can be really, um, well, they can be really inefficient, less than 1% in some cases. So just going from that 1% to 5% could be a really um, a revolutionary for, for things like mineral combinations, specifically for, um, for natural materials. For alkaline materials, it probably doesn't matter so much because I don't think the dissolution rate of those minerals or those materials really is the rate limiting step but things for like, for natural uh, materials the dissolution rate is the is almost certainly the rate limiting step um, for particularly for silicate minerals um, so being able to uh, invent a technology uh, that can grind a particle down to you know sub 100 microns maybe at 5% efficiency could be pretty revolutionary for exploiting that carbonation potential. So I, I think that covers all of the questions that, I, um, that I've been asked. If there are any others, uh, please do get in contact with me. Um, my email is p.renforth at hw.ac.uk um, and I've also got a Twitter which you're welcome to follow. So thanks a lot for, for attending my presentation and hopefully I'll see you soon.